Sometimes, words contain little secrets and insights. Take the word culture, for example. Notice anything funny? I don't think it's coincidental that the word cult figures prominently. After all, culture displays many of the hallmarks we typically associate with cults. Let's go over the checklist, shall we? Indoctrination? Check. Adherence to dogmatic rules, rigid traditions, and unspoken taboos? Check. Two-tiered system where different rules apply to our leaders? Check. Shunning and persecuting anyone who refuses to follow the rules? Definitely a check. We're all born into this cult, but few of us ever realize it. How could we? Everything we think we know, everything we believe, are very definitions of key concepts such as goodness, truth, beauty, and success come from our culture, and were chosen for us before we could ever choose for ourselves. Look at all the trouble we go through to fit in and be liked, to meet a certain standard, appear a certain way, or whatever. It's all part of our cult brainwashing. Now consider that the role models and leaders of the past that we admire the most are all renegades and nonconformists. Take Socrates, Siddhartha Gautama, and Jesus of Nazareth, for example. They were leaders, not followers. They surveyed the state of the world, and they revolted. They envisioned a better way and pursued that fearlessly, consequences be damned. Socrates didn't learn the Socratic method from another philosopher. He invented it. Gautama didn't convert to Buddhism. He founded it. Jesus wasn't a Christian, just a teacher who tried to show his students what truly matters in life. Make no mistake, all three were raised in the cult. Somewhere along the way, however, they woke up, journeyed within themselves, and found the strength to leave. They forged their own paths, then came back and encouraged us to do the same. But instead of learning the lessons, we enshrined the teachers and institutionalized their traditions. In the process, the essence of their teachings became twisted, obscured, or intentionally misrepresented. And what is the essence of their teachings? That humans exist in two worlds simultaneously. That one world is primary and foundational, while the other is secondary and spectral. And finally, that we humans have somehow lost our way and gotten our priorities backward. We value the secondary and ignore the primary, to our detriment. So what are these two worlds, and which one comes first? The Buddha lays it out clearly and simply in the Dhammapada. He says, All experiences are preceded by mind, having mind as their master, created by mind. So according to the awakened one, the mental, psychological, or spiritual world is primary, and the phenomenal world of sensory experiences is merely a byproduct. Let's see what Socrates says on this topic. In Plato's Apology, he says, O oh my friends, why do you who are citizens of the great and mighty and wise city of Athens care so much about laying up the greatest amount of money and honor and reputation and so little about wisdom and truth and the greatest improvement of the soul, which you never regard at all. Are you not ashamed of this? And who can forget what Jesus said in Matthew 6? He said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why were Socrates, Jesus, and Buddha outsiders? It's obvious, isn't it? While humankind obsesses over the material world, these individuals bring up concerns of a purely psychological nature. Having located a source of power within themselves, a power much greater than secular authority or material wealth or military might even, they try to show us how to reach that same indwelling power. Is it any wonder their teachings antagonized the authorities, that some of them became reclusive hermits, 
while others were killed for even speaking of such things publicly. You remember our cult checklist, don't you? This is what happens when you step out of line. They cast you out, and if that's not enough, then they poison, hang, or crucify you. But even ruthless punishment is powerless. The cult has killed many messengers, but the message lives and shall continue to live on. In every age there have been people who by luck or design managed to escape the cult. These ones heard the message ringing loudly in their hearts and became compelled to deliver it, however imperfectly, however slowly, to those with ears to hear. So here it is in a nutshell and in my own flawed and imperfect words. Your Savior is close at hand. Salvation is near. Look in the mirror. There's your Savior. Now look within yourself. There's your salvation. <laughs>